so excited for our next guest. He's an author, an astrophysicist, and a genius. We are so excited to have him join us. I've been waiting a long time as a woman in STEM. He's going to talk to us about everything going on in our world and the worlds we don't even know yet. Please welcome Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> Woo! So excited about this. Thank you. Thank you. I love the Christmas welcome decoration. Neil. Very beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. <laughs> Okay, Thank you. first things first, being that you're a scientist, has it been frustrating for you to see so many people this year disregard scientific fact and believe in conspiracy theories instead? <laughs> I am dying to hear from you. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Neil needs his own Poor emoji, Neil. just... You know, it's, it's one... I know, that, that's an emoji right there, okay. Um, it's one thing to stand in denial of science if it has no actual consequence either to yourself or to the world. You know, there are people who will read their horoscope and, you know, that's innocent enough. You know, the world won't end based on what you decide to do from your horoscope. But if you, if you choose to decline the advice of medical professionals, of scientific um, of predictions for what will happen to the environment, that, that is a problem in a world that depends so heavily on science. Right, Just scientific out findings. Just think about this, just pulling out your smartphone. It's talking to GPS satellites. It's got all, you know, decades of technology inside of it. You're going to do that and then say, oh, I'm not going to wear a mask because I don't believe the scientists. There's a disconnect there. So my, my worry is not, as an educator, I don't want to go around and hit people on the head. What I ask is, is there something missing in the educational pipeline? So that mm. if that were corrected, added to or subtracted from, then people would not grow into adults who will sit there yeah. and pick and choose what science they want or, or don't want right. to believe. That's the problem. Oh, right. So good. Got it. So true. Mm. Yes, and a recent article in the Daily Mail reported that aliens are real and are secretly in contact with America and Israel. So teach us here. Could this be true? How do we and specifically real truth. America and Israel? And yeah. your sources are? <laughs> right. <laughs> Good question. Exactly. Right. So that's, the Daily Mail? And the okay. They chose. <laughs> right. So, but Neil, this is a good question because people believe what they read. So, how do we know what's a real source? Okay. So, you can, uh, that, that, that's a really important question because we're bombarded with all kinds of information in print, in the internet, and stuff you look up. And a quick thing about things you look up, all right, what a Google search or any search does is it takes what you asked, filters out everything else, and brings you back things that fulfill your expectations, leaving you with the wrong impression that your ideas are somehow valid. So if I start typing in, I think the Earth is flat. It'll find every other person in the world who also thinks that. It'll point to their web pages, and all of a sudden, my thoughts are validated. Are there or aren't they? So, so, so back to aliens. So, so what you have to believe is that aliens have visited Earth, and only secret U.S. government agencies and Israels know about this. So, so first, <laughs> anyone who has worked for the government knows they're not good at keeping secrets. First... <laughs> Second, <laughs> if an alien, well, why would aliens only visit Navy F-18 fighter pilots? Okay? Right. Everybody, did you realize six billion, billion photos and videos are uplifted to the internet every single day? And the aliens are somehow avoiding everybody who's got a walking <laughs> video camera? camera? <laughs> right, right, so just think them. this through about this. So it doesn't pass the sort of the first cut sanity test on what could be true. And by the way, science literacy is inoculates you against people who would otherwise be saying things that are not true at all. Right. Wow. That makes yeah. sense. Well, in other science news, we're expecting a big event to take place on December 21st with Jupiter and Saturn. Please tell us what's happening. Put us on. Yeah, I'm thinking you should not miss that, okay? Um, <laughs> because the last time it happened where everyone could, anyone could have seen it was 800 years ago, all right? In the, in wow. the, in the, in the tw what year was it, 12, 
23 or something like that. If you got, go back ago. then, this happened. So do, you don't want to miss this. And as we orbit How the sun. How do we watch it? Oh, no, it's not hard. No, no, it's easy. It's easy. No telescope or anything. As we orbit the sun, our point of view and our angle on other planets changes constantly. So, and they move around the sun as well. It just so happens that the sun, that, that Jupiter and Saturn will line up such that they're so close to each other that if you remove your glasses, they might look like just one object on the sky. And it's shortly after sunset, you'll see two objects in the sky, which are embarrassingly close to each other. That's going to be Jupiter and Saturn doing just this. And the fun part is, as the days approach, only a few days left, you can watch them get closer and closer and closer. Because normally things move, but they're so in empty areas, you can't notice it. Now you can notice it as they inch together more wow. closely. Wow. So awesome. oh, I, I can't wait for that. And, you know, and Neil, you're one of the world's most famous astrophysicists. So I'm curious, if Elon Musk asked you to get on his spaceship and go to Mars, would you go? I just, I've been <laughs> waiting for this. <laughs> would you go? Okay, so I've thought about this. I've thought about uh -huh. this. And so my, my, I, I, I finally settled on my answer. The answer is yes, but only after he sends his mother to Mars and brings her back safely. Oh, then I'll know. Uh, that part. Good plan. Good that part. Good plan. Good answer. That's a good very answer. good check right there. Great yes. plan. Stick to that. <laughs> Got it. So you obviously know your stuff, but do you have an idea of how much of the universe we don't know about? You know, that's an interesting question because often people don't ask that. They say, well, what do you know today? What did you learn? What did you discover? And they, they don't come around and ask how, how, how cosmically stupid are we? <laughs> Nobody asks that. <laughs> so it turns out we, there are certain things we can quantify about what we don't know. For example, there's this mysterious pressure in the vacuum of space that we call dark energy. We can measure it, and it's forcing the universe to accelerate in its expansion, but we don't know what's causing that. But we, me mm. we measure its effects. Another thing is we call dark, dark, what do you call it? A dark matter, which is something that is adding extra gravity to the universe that we can't account for tallying up the stars, sun, moon, planets, even black holes. These two things, when added together, are 95% of all that drives the universe. So Extra all the biology, gravity. chemistry, and all the things we know and learn in school are in 5% of what matters in this universe. So, yeah, we're really plum wow. stupid. Wow. <laughs> you know I'm what? <laughs> but you know what? At I'm least we stupid have is not the word. like you. We are ignorant of most of what is driving this universe. And yeah. that excites me. I mean, it can sound depressing, but I say, wow, maybe I'll more. discover a little extra piece of that as I, as I move along here. And that brings to mind the old saying that as the area of your knowledge grows, so mm -hmm. too does the perimeter of your ignorance. Yeah, your or ignorance stupidity. <laughs> beyond <laughs> that circle, yeah. <laughs> It's okay, so Neil, true. because we have you to help us explain these things, <laughs> and you explore as much of the world as you can on your show, Cosmos, Possible Worlds. But is there anything that you've learned while hosting this show? Oh, another great question. So I'm professionally, I'm an astrophysicist, but Cosmos, one of its great sort of signature elements is that it blends together all the sciences because the universe doesn't put chemistry in one book and biology in a different book and physics in another book. Right. It is all one seamless cosmos. And so the show blends that beautifully. And we have uh, panels of scientists that have expertise that I don't carry. So one of the things I'd love learning about was this underground network of plant communication. It's officially mm. called the mycelium. But those um, had fun with that, and they call it, some call it the, the wood wide web. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the wood, so trees are intercommunicating <laughs> below the ground along with other root systems. And they know if one tree has been attacked by, by insects or, been, or the bark is damaged, this information is communicated. And they, they respond in, in, a, in a coherent way. 
those might remember, some people might remember some scenes from the movie Avatar, where the whole forest is one sort of mind, and yeah. you can plug into it. They had these USB ponytails, the, the aliens, and they could plug into it. But J <laughs> James Cameron didn't pull that out of nowhere. He knew and understood right. that there is this communicating. So I did not know about that before hosting the episode that contained it. Mm. So, uh, so I learned quite a bit outside of the astrophysics world. Well, speaking of your show, because this is all so fascinating, let's take a look at a clip of Cosmos Possible Worlds. After its first half billion years, Earth was spinning faster than it does today. The days were shorter, merely six hours long. The moon was 10 times closer, and its gravitational grip on the young planet was much stronger. The shores of the land were battered by the largest tidal waves the world has ever known, a thousand times greater than they are today. The infant Earth was no place for us then. Wow, wow. That was intense. Wow. I'm so excited to watch this. <laughs> I'm feeling it. And, and, and we recorded that a couple of years ago. I'm feeling that now. But a quick thing I, I think I look pretty good in that suit. Just to, and you know who designed it? <laughs> Looking you know who designed good. it? Who? Ruth Carter from oh, the Black Panther. Black the Panther. costume designer. Yes. Oh, that's And also yes. coming to America, too. To be a costume designer for Cosmos. And so oh, that's, that's why I'm kind of walking. Incredible. She's fantastic. <laughs> awesome. You're Smashing. fantastic. Neil, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today. You can well, catch Cosmos interest. Possible and, Worlds. And, and call. I'm around. We, we talk about the universe anytime. <laughs> Love it. I want your number. You I want it. it. You can catch Cosmos Possible Worlds tonight on Fox at 8, 7 Central.